Welcome to the first broadcast of Tweed's Pods, a production of the Theodore Roosevelt Association. I am Tweed Roosevelt, the president and interim executive director of the association and a great-grandson of TR. We will be developing these podcasts on a more or less regular basis. Each will highlight an individual who has something relevant to say about TR and his legacy. We anticipate interviewing a wide range of people, such as authors, collectors, naval personnel, members of the Park Service, elected officials, scientists working on areas related to TR, and many others. Over the next few months, we will give you a preview of various speakers who will be coming to our annual meeting to be held at Sagamore Hill on the weekend of October 28th to 30th. You can learn more about our meeting by going to our website at www.theodoreroosevelt.org where you can also join the association if you're not already a member. Or you can call our offices at uh, 516-921-6319. And also, feel free to pass these podcasts on to anyone you think might be interested. Now, let's get right down to it. Our first guest is Jeffrey Cowan, author of the book, Let the People Rule, Theodore Roosevelt and the Birth of the Presidential Primary. Not only is it an excellent read, and I've read it, but also it could hardly be more relevant in these very interesting times in our political history. A little about Jeff. We were classmates at Harvard, but I really got to know him during the 1968 Democratic Convention, where I played a minor role, and he led the very important Commission on the Democratic Selection of Presidential Nominees, the report of which is as relevant today as it was then. Jeff has done a great many things in his life, and I'll touch on only a few here. After Harvard, he attended Yale Law School, during which time he participated in the raucous 1968 Democratic Convention. He also was involved in black voter registration efforts in Mississippi. He started the first public interest law firm in the U.S. He was a member of the Board of Directors of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. He was a director of The Voice of America, and he was a prolific journalist. As if this weren't enough, he's had a long and distinguished career, culminating for 11 years as dean of USC's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and now crowned as a university professor of that institution. But wait, there's more. He's also president of the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands, hosting three summits with President Obama. I've left out a lot, but you get the idea. So now I would like to welcome Jeff. Are you there, Jeff? I'm here, Tweed, and I want to say it's an honor to be your first guest, and it's fun to be on with you. Let's start out. Tell us about your new book, Let the People Rule, and how you came to write it. In 1968, I had been working for Eugene McCarthy. Uh, other friends of mine were working for Bobby Kennedy, trying to, uh, to get the Democratic nomination for an anti-war candidate that year. Uh, and yet, when we won almost all the primaries... Hubert Humphrey, who had not won a single primary, got the Democratic Party's nomination. That seemed inherently un- unfair. So I put together a commission that you were part of, uh, which suggested that the delegates should all be picked through an open process uh, and through political primaries. My hero that year, my inspiration, was Theodore Roosevelt and what he had done in 1912. But there was a book by a guy named George Mowry. I'm sure it's on your list somewhere, Tweed. It sure is. And I read that book more than once in order to try to understand how it all started. And when I had the chance years later, I decided, wouldn't it be great to really dig into it and find my own story? And that's what I did with Let the People Rule. Well, tell us a little about the research. Uh, I, love, I love research, and I consider it a kind of time travel. When you find documents that other people haven't read before, you really feel you're living there. And, and surprising as it may be, there's a tremendous amount of Roosevelt's material that has never been probed before. People tend to use Roosevelt's outgoing letters, which were collected in eight volumes by Elting Morrison and John Morton Blum and so forth, but he had a huge volume of incoming letters. And so by going to those incoming letters that are available in the Library of Congress, I found terrific new material. I also became interested in the governors who had urged him to run, and their papers were all preserved. And so Chase Osborne was the governor of Michigan at the time, and one of his great correspondents was a former rough rider named Franklin Knox, who later became Secretary of the Navy under the other Roosevelt. But, but he had been a rough rider. He was a close friend of Roosevelt. He was chairman of the party, and he wrote regular letters Chase Osborne that nobody had ever seen before. One of my most interesting 
uh, finds was a, a man named Ormsby McCard, who I loved partly because of his name. Well, late one night, I found somebody else looking for material about Ormsby McCard. I connected with this person. It turned out he was Ormsby McCard's grandson, and he was the person who McCarg's papers had been given to. He had never shared them with anybody, and he shared with me uh, correspondence with and letters about Roosevelt and this campaign. So time and again, I found new material, and I think it's why the story is so fresh. Yes, it certainly comes across that way, uh, and I certainly learned a lot. You know, they, as you say, there have been a lot of books written on this subject, one by one of our past executive directors, which for a long time was sort of the book, but this is a whole new view at it. Well, tell us, what are some of the major surprises you uncovered? Well, there were several things. First of all, I had always assumed that he ran because he was upset with some of Taft's policy. That's certainly true. But I became convinced that this was largely also a personal decision, that this man who was such a phenomenal figure and had been in the middle of the arena everywhere, he wasn't at the center of the action. And, and he was also feeling kind of old and rheumatic and tired, which is shocking. His voice he didn't feel was up to it and so forth, what has it been. But as Taft himself, who he loved, William Howard Taft, said that the one thing that could bring him back to action was that he could only fight. And the one thing he could do was to fight by taking on Taft. So I think it was very personal. For example, I thought that he believed in primaries. That's why I wrote the book, but it turned out he was against primaries until he was for them. I don't know how I thought he raised his money, but I guess I thought he used the Internet or something. <laughs> the most important supporters, whose names I knew but knew very little about, George Perkins and... Uh, Frank Muncy, they were really backing him largely because of U.S. Steel and the fact that Taft had filed an antitrust suit against U.S. Steel. But the biggest shocker was that when he started his own new party, the Bull Moose Party, this party that was so based on progressive ideas of the era, that he decided to exclude any black delegates from the Deep South. And that was surprising to me. And of course, as you know, it, it forms the uh, last part of the book. Well, I think you have a point that T.R. certainly for political reasons, excluded the blacks from the convention. Now, he was a practical politician, and, and one of the reasons he felt that he didn't push more equality during his own presidency, although he believed in it, was that he knew it was a lost cause at that time. It'd have to wait till later. Well, let's switch a little bit and go to uh, the 1968 Democratic Convention. How did your work in 1968 change the playing field from where it stood at uh, TR's 1912 uh, changes? Well, up through 1968, uh, there were primaries, but the party could decide not to go with the winner of the primary. So in 1952, the, the Democratic Party went with, uh, with uh, Adlai Stevenson, who hadn't run any primaries, instead of Estes Kefauver, who had basically run them all, won them all, including one against Terry Truman that had knocked Truman out of the race. And in 1968, as I mentioned earlier, they went with uh, with Hubert Humphrey, even though Humphrey hadn't run any primaries. Today, I think there are a lot of people in the Republican Party, anyway, who wish they could do that same thing. But yes. the reason they can't is the reforms that uh, you and I were both associated with in 1968, which have made it so that virtually all of the delegates now are picked uh, through an open process in which the people do have a right to, to rule. And I think if, uh, if the parties tried to reject the will of the voters this, this year because we've become so accustomed to the notion that people should get the right to rule, unlike 1952, unlike 1968, I think there would be a more dramatic result. Well, what do you make of the, what is it called, Rule 50, which uh, is the one that says that uh, no nominee can be chosen who didn't win at least, I think, eight states eight is the rule? I, one of the things we now know about delegate selection process is that it's shaped by the party for the interest of what they think is, is the people they want to be nominated. And it was that in 1912. That's, they, they pick the party, they set the party rules, and the rules are as fixed as they can be to help the people they think should be nominated. Well, I think they thought that if you required eight states to do it, they'd keep out a lot of riffraff as, as delegates. Yeah. And as candidates. <laughs> it seems to work the other way in some it sense. Works, you know, and by the way, that's frequently true. The parties, you know, they're private clubs, Tweed, so they can decide on the floor of the convention to change their rules. And the delegates who are there are not necessarily committed on those issues to the people they're pledged to vote for on the first ballot. So even though it might be against Trump's interest, his own delegates pledge to him, if they are close to being party insiders, they may vote for a rule which does away with that uh, requirement for eight states and, and many other rules that will not be friendly to Trump. 
one of the most important things that happens in conventions I learned in 68 and subsequently you know, are these rules and how they change and who gets to vote on them and how it works. And for most people, that's pretty boring, but it's critical, isn't it? And, of course, they can all change. We've seen the, the convention make decisions that are ad hoc, made at the moment, and often against the wishes of people in the states. The courts have made it clear that the conventions are private associations, and as I say, they're like the National Football League. I know our listeners would love to hear a great deal more from you, Jeff, and in fact they can. Come to our annual meeting, which will be at Sagamore Hill, as I've said, on the weekend of October 28th through 30th. Jeff will be one of our speakers, and he will tell you quite a bit more. And, of course, we'll see it from a whole different perspective just a few days before the election. Seeing you tweet there, and I look forward to seeing your members there. <laughs> Great. Go to uh, www.theodoreroosevelt.org or call our offices at 516-921-6319. And non-members, do that too. Join us. You'll have a lot of fun. Uh, so also, remember to feel free to share this podcast with anyone you might think might be interested. And again, thank you for listening. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.